$4 billion investment in the United States uh, to build electric vehicles and batteries, which is, I mean, for, for any company uh, to invest that much and have that kind of faith in, in an American worker um, was very welcome. And the fact that it's a Vietnamese company is just remarkable, I think, um, no matter what, you, what, you know, who's, what, you, what your view is. And so really this is a relationship that continues to go from strength to strength. And I think it's because we, you know, our, our interests are fairly well aligned. Uh, we, we share uh, an interest in, in maintaining the sort of rules-based international order. We share an interest in ensuring that the South China Sea uh, remains free and open and, and you know, able to ships and other commerce to, to move through unimpeded, that countries in the region aren't uh, coerced and are able to make decisions uh, based on their own interests and not uh, that of outside interests, um, and on and on. I mean, I could go on, but uh, it really, it's, it's, I think we, in the last 15 years, especially the last 10 years, we've really found our way together with Vietnam, and it's, it's I think, a relationship that's on nothing but an upward trajectory right now, and it's very exciting to be here and to be working on this, this great friendship and partnership. Yeah, th thank you for, for sort of tracing that enormous project. I think when you're involved in it on a day-to-day -day basis or tracking it as long as we have um, it, it does seem slow and hard, but when you look back, it's really amazing uh, how far the relationship has, has come. It's, it's uh, I, I'd say, quite dramatic. Um, I think what uh, is interesting now and, and often in the news is, um, are we on the precipice of, you know, taking it to another level? Uh, and um, I know that... Uh, You've welcomed some very uh, senior visitors uh, to Hanoi, like uh, Vice President Kamala Harris and Secretary of Defense uh, Lloyd Austin. Um, when the idea of upgrading the relationship um, from a comprehensive partnership to, in diplomatic terms, a strategic partnership uh, has been discussed uh, directly and openly uh, with the Vietnamese leadership. Um, this idea has been discussed, I think, off and on uh, for quite a while and never quite gotten over the finish line. And I'm, I'm wondering um, if we could get your perspective on why is it important um, and where might it be heading? And, and is there some reason for, for optimism that we're going to get across the finish line? Well, thanks for that, Jonathan. And uh, yes, I think if, uh, if you Google my various um, public remarks, the press interviews, you name it, I do talk about uh, quite often the, uh, the desire, the U.S., uh, strong U.S. desire to upgrade our relationship from a comprehensive partnership, uh, which we've had for the last 10 years, uh, to a strategic partnership. And, and really, I think it's, it's two things. First of all, um, I think it's just a, simply a reflection of what we are already doing with Vietnam. Um, our cooperative efforts with, with the government of Vietnam are already fundamentally strategic in nature. Um, whether it's uh, the work we do together um, in the South China Sea, uh, upholding our shared interests here in terms of protecting sovereignty and, and ensuring a free and open South China Sea, um, whether it's uh, dealing with issues related to um, the Mekong River, whether it's uh, addressing environmental issues, whether it's addressing uh, issues related to transnational crimes. Again, very fundamentally strategic um, we work very closely with Vietnam, as I said earlier, on health issues. Um, what began as a very focused HIV AIDS effort back in 2004, 5, 6 um, is now a multifaceted, very uh, broad effort together on everything from tuberculosis um, to COVID-19. And again, when you're addressing these kind of existential issues like global pandemics, how we do it together, whether it's surveillance, whether it's prevention, whether it's treatment, um, fundamentally strategic in nature, and climate change and energy, another couple areas uh, in which we're working very closely with Vietnam, climate mitigation and adaptation, uh, working with Vietnam uh, on energy, energy transition as it um, seeks to, to actualize its very bold uh, commitment to be net zero, carbon net zero by 2050, and uh, we want to be a part of this discussion, and um, this is the fundamentally transformative effort uh, one, again, that is existential in nature, and this is something um, that we consider uh, ourselves to be close partners and, and strategic ones at that. And so, uh, really, it's, and, and so that's the sort of point one, which is the upgrade is a reflection of what we already got going on. 
Um, but I think, I think the second point I'd make is that um, this upgrade, I think, would, would help to unlock even further um, a number of doors to even closer cooperation in a number of areas, um, whether it's, in, you know, it's defense, law enforcement, security, um, high level engagement, diplomatic and political cooperation, et cetera. Um, these are areas I think that taking it to the next level would allow us uh, to be even more coordinated and uh, more closely uh, engaged with each other in the years ahead. And as far as the, uh, your, I guess your final question, uh, the prospects of this, well, of course, I'm a, I'm a sort of eternal optimist. Um, and, uh, you know, I have, but I still have a magic eight ball in my office and I shake it every once in a while. And I always get the answer, you know, signs are good or, or things are looking in the right direction. So I'm pretty optimistic. I think uh, both of our, well, I can't speak for, for the government of Vietnam, but certainly in the government of the United States, um, we're very focused on, on making this happen and um, we're going to continue our efforts to that end. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm delighted to hear that. Um, and uh, I've also uh, noticed uh, your, your many comments on this issue as well uh, as ambassador, uh, you know, in, in Vietnam. Um, maybe if I could address uh, perhaps the elephant in the room a little bit, um, you know, a, uh, a kind of mantra that we hear from the region often as U.S.-China rivalry ratchets up uh, and there's fears, uh, you know, uh, about a potential new Cold War and so on, um, is that countries in the region, you know, with different nuances and perspectives don't want to have to choose. And uh, I think there's some analysis out there that uh, is that maybe the Vietnamese might be a little bit concerned uh, that a strategic partnership between the U.S. Uh, and uh, Vietnam could be construed in Beijing as, as hostile to China. Uh, and so they have to consider this question uh, very carefully. Um, and they do have uh, a lot of economic integration with China and so on. Uh, where there could be potentially uh, some blowback or, or leverage uh, um, that China might exercise. Um, and, uh, and yet Vietnam has great concerns about their territorial disputes with China in the South China Sea. Uh, and it seems like they're trying to uh, expand relations in a multi-directional way, including with the United States. Um, but I'm just wondering if you see that, uh, if you're able to comment, uh, as sort of contributing to a little bit of hesitancy uh, on their side? You know, I mean, I think, um, you know, Vietnam traditionally has, as you said, had multi-directional diplomacy, um, always endeavors to be friends with everyone, enemies uh, with none. Um, they've got a very clear position on uh, the use of force in foreign, in, in foreign policy, which is that they'll never use force in foreign policy. Um, but I, I don't, um, you know, I think there's intrinsic value in this relationship, just as, as we um, will never uh, talk about Vietnam in the context of our China policy. Um, you know, we talk about Vietnam in the context of, of U.S.-Vietnam relations. There is intrinsic value in, in strong U.S.-Vietnam ties. It's not about um, Vietnam or any of the countries in the region, for that matter, being uh, those sort of pawns on a, on a strategic chessboard. And so we, we like to approach our relationship here in that sense um, to ensure that uh, we continue to work together for our shared goals, uh, which is ultimately, um, you know, we want a Vietnam that is strong and independent and prosperous. Uh, we want a Vietnam that's capable of uh, defending its, its territorial integrity, uh, protecting its sovereignty, ensuring that um, its international law is upheld in the South China Sea and elsewhere, and that includes the UN. Convention on the Law of the Sea from 1982. Um, as Kamala Harris, Vice President Harris said last year, we uh, respect each other's political systems. And so everything we do with Vietnam is about Vietnam. It's about our relationship. It's about um, promoting prosperity, security, stability, um, not just uh, for the people of the United States, but the people of Vietnam. And so you know, we'll continue to, to, to do that. Um, and whatever calculation you know, are made here vis-a-vis -vis the neighbors, um, you know, that's, that's not something for us to, to comment on, um, but suffice to say that, um, you know, we, we do share a lot of interests, um, namely that the South China Sea uh, it remains uh, free of coercion. Um, as Secretary Blinken uh, regularly says, uh, we're not trying to force countries to make a choice, um, but they should have the ability to choose. And, uh, and so that's something uh, really wise approach, not just to places like Vietnam, but others 
others here in the region. And so um, we'll continue to, uh, to work with our friends here in Vietnam to ensure that everything we do is for the sake of not just the American people, but the Vietnamese people as well. Yeah, I, I think uh, the region in general uh, has welcomed uh, the messaging uh, from Secretary Blinken and others uh, in the administration uh, about not forcing countries to choose. Um, I, uh, I, I really noticed um, what's interesting to me, and I think some of these things may be a little bit nascent, but you talked about shared interests and I think also, um, you know, long term objectives uh, that are shared between the United States and Vietnam. Um, you know, one thing, uh, a big development in the region, uh, you know, uh, is the development of the, the quad or the, the, the further development of the quad, the quadrilateral security dialogue um, uh, with uh, U.S., Australia, India uh, and Japan. Um, and some in ASEAN uh, see this as maybe a little bit of a, a threat. Uh, maybe that's too strong of a word, but it's making the regional architecture a little bit crowded. Uh, from an ASEAN-centric uh, standpoint, um, but the Vietnamese seem uh, a little more forward-leaning uh, compared to ASEAN, other ASEAN countries. Uh, I know that they participated in what are sometimes called Quad Plus uh, meetings related to uh, coordination on uh, the pandemic um, and other innovative areas of, uh, of regional cooperation between the U.S. Uh, and Vietnam has been uh, the establishment recently, I guess, uh, of a new CDC regional office to support public health engagement uh, of the U.S. Uh, in Southeast Asia as a whole, presumably, you know, in coordination with Vietnam. Um, so I, I think these are, I see as uh, very positive developments about uh, how there's some common thinking between uh, the U.S. and Vietnam in Southeast Asia or in the region as a whole. Just wondering if you have any comment on that. Sure. Well, you're um, you're right. Uh, you mentioned this kind of, although it was really never um, billed as a quad plus. I guess that uh, that's sort of the, the the name that stuck. But uh, but during the yeah, pandemic, yeah. Uh, regular uh, conversations among uh, quad members, uh, United States, Australia, India, and Japan, plus a couple of other countries like Vietnam and, and New Zealand, um, and it was really an effort just to ensure that we were well coordinated. Uh, when it came to to vaccine distribution and and uh, provision of, of personal protective equipment, things like that, um, but I think I mean if you look at you know what the Quad is working on, I mean it, it's it's things um, that I think are are appealing um, to to the government of Vietnam, whether it's uh, in the health sphere or whether it's in um, maritime domain awareness. In other words, uh, ensuring that countries have the ability to um, understand and know what's happening in their, their maritime space and their territorial waters. And that includes uh, ensuring that they have access to, you know, open source satellite data or, or, or radar data. Um, you know, the Quad, of course, works on other areas, uh, supply chain issues, energy issues. And so, I mean, these are all things that we do bilaterally with Vietnam anyways. Um, these aren't in striking out on, on any new uh, or novel uh, areas of, of cooperation. And so, um, again, I'm hesitant to sort of try and be a spokesperson here for, for our Vietnamese friends, but my sense is that given what the Quad's mandate is up until now, um, these are these are areas um, that are not just part of our approach to Vietnam, but actually are part of our broader Indo-Pacific strategy, um, which includes um, things related to free and open Indo-Pacific, um, promoting ASEAN centrality, uh, promoting prosperity, security, uh, resilience in the face of climate issues and, and global pandemic issues. So, um, you know, while I'm uh, certainly um, I'm not going to try to advertise for an expanded quad, quad or anything like that, uh, I know that sometimes comes up, but I, I will say that I think our efforts within the context of the quad um, certainly reflect and complement very well our already strong bilateral efforts with, with Vietnam. Um, thanks for raising the, the, the creation of the CDC, regional CDC office uh, here in Hanoi. Um, that was uh, an announcement that Pres uh, Vice President Kamala Harris made when she was here last year. And I think it's, it's a reflection of a couple things. One, um, again, it's um, just uh, really, I think it's a reflection of the strong confidence that we have in, um, in our Vietnamese partners in, in the health sphere. And this goes back to the muscle memory that was built over, you know, almost two decades of health cooperation, starting with 
HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, COVID-19. And we felt that, that Vietnam um, had sort of the capability as, as a partner uh, to play a good host for this, this regional um, organization, this regional effort. Um, and at the same time, I think it's a reflection certainly of the view that we have of, of Vietnam as a regional leader. I mean, they have done uh, really well. They were hosts of APEC, uh, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, twice now, uh, 2006 and 17. Uh, of course, they were the ASEAN chair in 2000 and I want to say 20, um, in the middle of, of COVID. Um, and, you know, it's always a challenge to be the, the chair of ASEAN, but it's even more so when, when you can't do anything in, in person. But they pulled it off brilliantly um, through various means, virtual meetings, you name it. Um, Vietnam was on the UN Security Council um, for two years, 2019 to 2021. And so, you know, increasingly we're seeing a Vietnam that's global, that's got a global viewpoint that, um, that wants to be a global player. And it's, we certainly support that. And uh, we support their role as a regional leader as well. And so things like the CDC office here that has a, a broad focus on the region is something I think we, we feel is, is very appropriate and it has been very effective to date. Yeah, that, that, that's uh, where I think um, maybe to kind of round out this discussion on, on a possible uh, strategic partnership and then move on to, to other topics. Um, you know, obviously there's, there's some alignment, uh, I think, between the U.S. Uh, and Hanoi on South China Sea issues, as there are with, with other ASEAN partners in the region uh, as well. Um, but as one would look at the potential focus areas of a strategic partnership, uh, I think obviously defense and security would be there. But some of these other issues uh, like health, um, uh, climate, which you raised earlier, um, and, uh, you know, even infrastructure and, uh, you know, uh, transparent uh, development of infrastructure in Vietnam and in the Mekong generally. I think uh, these also, in my opinion, uh, I think uh, could uh, bubble up and, and be key areas. Uh, I know there's already work in those areas, but I, I do think they could be expanded. And I just, uh, one, one comment on climate, perhaps, um, and, and get your, your sense. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people might not know that the World Bank and other countries consistently rank Vietnam as among the top five countries that are most vulnerable to global warming um, and rising sea levels because of the long coastline and low-lying areas and so on. And uh, I think the Mekong Delta by 2050 could be, uh, you know, significantly inundated with millions of migrants uh, as a result. Uh, and um, I, I do think this... To, seems like a great growth area given the Biden administration's uh, focus on climate uh, broadly. And I just wanted to flag uh, this new $15 billion joint energy transition partnership that the U.S. is supporting with other G7 partners. Um, and uh, it seems like a, a great new initiative that, that's still a work in progress just announced, I think, in December. But uh, before we move on to other topics, just any, any final thoughts? Um, on climate or the strategic partnership question. Well, thanks, and thanks for raising um, the the impact of climate change here in Vietnam. And it's um, I've been down to to the Mekong Delta in the south a couple of times uh, already, and it's uh, not. I mean, I mean, it is true. I mean, for sure, Vietnam is one of the top five most vulnerable countries um, to the effects of climate change, and. What we're seeing in the Mekong Delta now, it's, it's a disaster unfolding before our eyes. Um, you know, on the one hand, you have man-made you know, sort of effects of, of, of man in the form of all the damming that's taking place on the Mekong River up, up, you know, from, from China on down. And what that's done is it's slowed down the flow of the river. It's prevented, um, you know, the kind of nutrients that come in the silts from, from flowing into Vietnam, of course, which is the very end of the river. And with that, uh, with rising sea levels, you've got salt water increasingly pushing in against a weakened flow of the river. It's, it's impacting, you've got increasingly um, salty water uh, that farmers have to deal with, right? And so, and this is the breadbasket of Vietnam. And so you've got not just sort of the, the man-made the damming related issues, but just what's happening with climate and the rising sea levels. Um, and there's a lot of other things that are going on as well. But um, yeah, by 2050, if, if something's not done, um, the Mekong Delta is going to be ocean. And it's going to be um, a huge loss in terms not just of 
agricultural and economic output of that area, but of the, the really rich um, riverine culture that has developed over hundreds of years there. And so this is something that we, the United States government, are working very closely with Vietnam on our U.S. Agency of International Development, our U.S. Geological Survey, other American uh, government organizations, State Department, of course. Um, we're, we're down there in the Delta. We're trying to figure out how we can help uh, Vietnam. This is something that um, former Secretary of State and current uh, um, senior or special presidential envoy for climate, John Kerry, is intensely focused on. And so we are with Vietnam in this, uh, in a way that we were with Vietnam in the fight against COVID. I mean, this is, this is real world, this is real world stuff. This is happening before our eyes. And so we need to work together to do something about it. And, and of course, the other side of the coin is, is the energy transition piece, which is another, another important aspect of our relationship. Thanks for mentioning the, uh, we call it JETP, the Just Energy Transition Partnership. It's something uh, we have now with three, only three countries, uh, South Africa, Indonesia, and Vietnam. Vietnam is the third, and it's uh, about $15.5 billion um, that have been announced uh, by governments, banks, businesses, um, NGOs in the United States, the UK, the EU, and it's, it's our way of working with Vietnam as they, they make this very hard transition away from uh, fossil fuels like coal uh, to solar and to wind. And Vietnam is, is, you know, I guess, cursed with being one of the most climate vulnerable countries in the world, but also blessed with some of the most abundant um, renewable potential in the world. Wind, solar, I mean, it's, um, it's just, it's cracking that code of, of um, you know, regulatory changes and legal changes and um, figuring out, and you know, look, we're dealing with the United States as well, right? Um, taking care of, of workers in, in formal, formal industries like coal. How do you transition these kind of workers to, to renewable industries? And so, um, but again, this is something that we're very committed to here. The Vietnamese are committed to, and um, I know we're just uh, very, very um, eager together to try and uh, help Vietnam meet its very ambitious climate goals. Again, uh, 2050. Um, to be net zero, and so um, no one's uh, no one is um, underestimating the difficulty of this work. It's going to be tough, um, but you know we've we've done tough things before, uh, not just as a country, but working with partners like Vietnam, and, and we're ready to to succeed in this effort as well. Well, it's great to hear uh, how how the U.S. foreign policy is really focused and infused with uh, energy on, on the climate front in general and uh, in, in particularly vulnerable countries like Vietnam as well. Um, well, let's, let's, if we could um, turn a little bit to maybe domestic uh, developments in Vietnam and uh, as ambassador, I'm not sure how much you want to wade uh, into this territory, but um, I have to raise, you know, uh, Vietnam is such a stable uh, political system on kind of five yearly cycles of party congresses and uh, appointments of government officials uh, shortly thereafter. Um, but uh, in the news, uh, very dramatically uh, in the last couple months, um, was uh, news of how uh, an anti-corruption campaign that's been going on for years uh, had resulted in uh, um, some scandals and particularly uh, resignations of two deputy prime ministers uh, and the president, uh, who was a former prime minister, and there's different interpretations out there. I think one interpretation is uh, that it's a, uh, a kind of party-led campaign to uh, win factional battles and uh, take out pro-reform pro and pro-Western uh, leaders, um, which could have implications perhaps for uh, foreign policy and U.S.-Vietnam relations. Maybe there's an interpretation I've heard as well, which is this is really an effort by the party to sort of shore up uh, its legit legitimacy through enhanced accountability mechanisms and probably long term trends in foreign policy and economic reform won't be affected, but there could be some some hiccups. Um, I don't know if you agree with these uh, interpretations, but uh, any thoughts? Uh, should we those of us who follow this relationship closely, should we be worried? Well, I think uh, I think you. Uh can I say, uh, accurately captured, I think, uh, the different views that are out there uh, about what's going on. Um, and I think you were also right to, to, to allude to uh, sort of the difficulty it is for someone in my position to try and uh, wade too deeply into, um, into uh, figuring out or, or 
talk, talking publicly about what I think is going on here. But what I will say, what I can say is, um, you know, there's nothing here that would uh, lead me to believe um, that the current trajectory that Vietnam is on with the United States is going to change, or that is or that it is changing. I think um, it's very clear to us, and uh, you know, regardless of whatever changes are going on at the top uh, as a result of uh, this ongoing anti-corruption campaign, um, in spite of all that, um, what we see is a continued commitment by government of Vietnam um, to improving, deepening, strengthening uh, the relationship with the United States. And so, um, you know, whether it's, it's formally welcoming senior American leaders, uh, we just had a few days ago, um, our U.S. Trade Representative, Ambassador Catherine Tai, uh, who is here for some excellent conversations about our, not just our bilateral trade relationship, but our, our multilateral trade efforts um, under the uh, auspices of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Uh, we've got some very senior folks coming in the, in the uh, time ahead, uh, um, including, um, including uh, for example, uh, members, you know, cabinet members, um, which I don't know, if, <laughs> I'm not sure if any of them been announced yet, so I'm going to head up and pause a second and just say that uh, we do have some very senior folks coming. Uh, I don't want to get ahead of any public announcements. Um, but all these things that we're seeing, none of them, to me, uh, are a sign of uh, a system that is uh, somehow reconsidering its fundamental commitment to, you know, strengthening relations with the U.S., um, promoting prosperity, um, growing the economy, and um, essentially engaging closely um, uh, with with countries uh, like Japan, like South Korea, like Australia, you know, allies and friends of the United States. And so, uh, very long and and probably completely um, uh, inconsequential answer to your question, Jonathan. But um, but I do want to stress that uh, that really it's there's nothing here that to me that indicates uh, and that that we're going to see any significant changes to the, the fundamental trajectory upon which Vietnam's foreign policy and economic policy are, are resting. You know, if I could ask one other kind of uh, maybe difficult to answer question, but uh, a big picture question as um, you and, and other members of the Biden administration are, are seeking to improve uh, relations with Vietnam and really, you know, take it to another level. And I think when you look at all the countries of Southeast Asia, in my opinion, I think, um, you know, we've got allies and partners, uh, emerging partners, uh, different categories, but uh, it always seems like uh, there's there's so much upside uh, with Vietnam, maybe more, uh, again, in my view, than, than, than just about any other country in the region. But it's a bit ironic in some ways because our political systems are so utterly different. Um, and, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I've lived in both, uh, well, I should digress and say I've lived many years of my life in both Beijing and Hanoi. And so I understand uh, there actually are great differences uh, between the political systems in, in both countries. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, Vietnam is a one party state uh, headed by a, a communist party. Um, and uh, I know um, if I'm getting this right, that the, the most recent annual human rights report uh, issued by the State Department did refer to significant human rights issues uh, in Vietnam. So I'm just wondering, as the administration uh, and President Biden himself talks uh, in broad terms about kind of a global, you know, struggle between democracy and autocracies in the world, how do you square um, the nature of the system there and the great interest of the U.S. to improving relations? Oh, that's a good question. And, um... And you know, if you go back uh, to July of 2021, um, when I appeared before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee to to um, for my my confirmation hearing, this is one of the points um, that I made about um, you know ongoing concerns uh, related to human rights, and and that um, you know our two countries uh, would never reach their, our fullest potential unless we saw a certain improvement. And, and, you know, this is, we stand by this, um, you know, we, we stay true to our values. Um, as, as Vice President Harris said when she was here last year, um, we're not always going to see eye to eye on these things. Um, but um, we do express our differences in a way that's, that's respectful, um, but all at the same time frank, and not always in public. And so, um, you know, and we, we've tried to abide by that, um, you know, when we deal with these issues. 
Um, certainly, we have our differences. And we recently, uh, a few weeks ago, months ago now, not even, um, had our most recent iteration of our human rights dialogue. And, and we did uh, raise um, concerns related to uh, say civil society or, or issues uh, you know, related to uh, certain uh, individuals who've been detained. Um, but, you know, uh, the, the, frankly, we, we also heard uh, from our Vietnamese counterparts uh, concerns related uh, in the United States to uh, gun violence, um, violence against Asians and Asian Americans. Um, you know, racial discrimination. And so, um, you know, none of us is perfect, and, but we do continue to sort of express our concerns both ways in a way that is respectful, open, frank, um, and, but often private and uh, sort of behind the scenes. We don't, uh, we try not to have these debates uh, you know, on the front page of the newspaper. Um, so it's, um, you know, I was here 15 years ago. These are discussions that we, we often had as well, um, it's a work in progress, and um, you know we continue uh, to seek improvements. But at the same time, recognizing that our systems are different, and but we do respect each other's political systems, and we've made that clear. Uh, we've made that clear for the last decade plus, and um, you know we'll continue to to work together to advance our interests, but also address our differences. Thanks, Ambassador. Um, Another topic I, I thought we could touch on a little bit um, is what is the state of play now in, you know, the security and defense uh, relationship between the U.S. and Vietnam? Um, I think, uh, you know, Vietnam uh, has a long history of procuring uh, Russian defense systems. Um, I understand the, the trend line is uh, going down uh, so that uh, uh, Hanoi is beginning to diversify and, and recently held, I think, a defense expo uh, that uh, was part of that effort. But the U.S. has been providing, uh, I think, a couple uh, refurbished Coast Guard cutters to the Vietnamese Navy and maybe another one on the way. Uh, quite dramatic in the context of, uh, the, you know, the, the, the war that was fought between our two countries, uh, the arrival of aircraft carriers uh, visiting uh, ports uh, in, in, uh, in Vietnam. I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about, um, you know, where this is, what are the latest developments and, and where is this relationship heading on the defense and security side? Well, thanks. And, and it's, um, I think uh, as we deepen our, our defense and security ties, I think, again, it's, it's a reflection of, um, you know, our shared, our shared interests, our shared interests in a, a region that's stable and free and open and the countries here are, are able to resist coercion are able to um, defend and, and protect their maritime interests, their, their territorial so integrity, their sovereignty. Um, and this is something um, in which we work very closely with Vietnam. You, you, you mentioned the um, provision of, of Coast Guard cutters. I mean, these are, I mean, these are big ships, actually. I visited yeah. one, and it's, um, it's, a, it's a pretty significant vessel, but it's, it's Coast Guard, and it's going to be part of Vietnam. It is part of Vietnam's Coast Guard. And, uh, and it's there to, to ensure that Vietnam is able to defend its interests, whether it's uh, counter piracy, whether it's um, you know, pushing back against illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing um, in its waters. So it's about you know, defending, protecting Vietnam's own uh, natural resources. Um, you know, working with Vietnam to, to ensure that it's got the capabilities it needs um, to defend its interests, whether in the air, in the sea, on land, and in, in cyberspace. Um, there was a, the first ever defense trade expo uh, last December, uh, which was a pretty big deal. Um, and it reflected, I think, um, you know, Vietnam's efforts to, um, to diversify and modernize its military. Um, you're correct that um, the vast, sort of a very large chunk of Vietnam's defense ecosystem is uh, Russian-based. And so certainly as Vietnam does work on diversifying and modernizing its, its defense uh, equipment. Um, you know, the United States and our great uh, defense companies, we want to be a part of that. And this is something, um, certainly a conversation that is ongoing and will continue, continue into the future. Um, you know, it's we, um, I mean, we definitely see, um, see cyber as another area of cooperation. And so, I mean, we're working on uh, cybersecurity uh, together with Vietnam to ensure that uh, they're able to um, 
protect their, their critical sort of cyber infrastructure as they are increasingly um, connected with, uh, with the world and uh, as Vietnamese companies and American companies in Vietnam are increasingly uh, engaged in commerce um, globally. And so I'm, I'm excited about our defense and security relationship. But if you take it a step further, law enforcement is another area that we work closely, um, whether it's, it's working together to um, fight against trafficking in persons, which remains you know, a problem here. Um, women, men, children being trafficked in the neighboring countries, um, whether it's, it's uh, working against trafficking in uh, wildlife, illegal wildlife trafficking, uh, whether it's counter narcotics cooperation, these are all areas um, in which we're working very closely together. And these are the kind of areas, whether it's law enforcement, security, um, defense, that require a certain level of trust, right? And, and these are things we couldn't do 10, 15 years ago. But the fact that we're able to do this now together, I think really does reflect a new level of, of, of engagement, of trust, of shared sense of mission um, that you're right, frankly, our, um, if you pull back a little and look, I mean, we were fighting against each other more than, you know, not more than 50 years ago. And so to get from there to here, I think is a remarkable testament um, to, to the efforts of both of our countries to, uh, to move forward and find a good future together. And, and speaking, speaking of the war and uh, maybe an aspect uh, that has uh, helped to uh, enhance that trust is uh, efforts to address a legacy of war issues like uh, unexploded ordnance, uh, landmines, uh, search for MIAs, and so on. Uh, what's the latest state of play in that space? So thanks. And uh, this is an important, really important area of cooperation. And really, it, it predates even normalization. Um, we normalized in 1995, but our efforts together to account for, um, you know, U.S. service members um, began even a few years before then. And it really, and we, we do, so when we talk about this, we, we, we sort of this broad basket of issues of war legacy, war legacy issues, which includes accounting for uh, missing service members, uh, and includes uh, mitigating and cleaning up unexploded ordnance, whether it's landmines or mortars or, or bombs that you know we dropped or, or uh, during the war and so um, and this is, a, this is significant because you've got huge huge swaths of land in central Vietnam mostly but all over the place that um, can't be cultivated can't be used um, because of concerns that there's still you know a meter down in the soil there's still something that you know, exploded mortar shell or or um, or, or the landmine and so you know, over, you know, for the last uh, 10 years and more, uh, the United States has been working with Vietnam to uh, to clean up to clean up uh, this what they call UXO unexploded ordnance. Um, our war legacy cooperation also includes uh, cleaning up um, Agent Orange uh, hotspots. They're called, which is um, not where we sprayed Agent Orange because actually Agent Orange um, dissipates or dissolves quite quickly under sunlight. But these are um, they're called hotspots because they're the sites of basically air bases that we used during the war to fly missions to spray Agent Orange. And so if you can picture um, drums, of, you know, dozens, hundreds of drums of, of this stuff uh, just sitting there, steeping into the soil and um, remain there for decades. And again, it um, prevented uh, any sort of useful use of that land. And so we have been working with Vietnam to, to clean these up. And it's a huge effort. It's very costly, time consuming. Um, but we've done it now at two different air bases. We're working on a third, um, and it's going to take another 10 years. But, but by succeeding here, um, not only do we allow this land to be used effectively for habitation, cultivation, whatever, um, but it, it, it's built trust, and it's built um, uh, really help to accelerate reconciliation between our two countries, same as the efforts we've had to assist people with disabilities. And so... Um, these efforts are ongoing. Um, these efforts are thanks uh, to a number of, of members of Congress, a number of very you know, con just concerned citizens, uh, folks here in Vietnam as well. I mean, this relationship get, got to where it is today, not by, you know, it didn't happen in a vacuum. Um, it didn't just, you know, appear out of nowhere. It took the hard work of, of, and goodwill of many, many, many people on both sides, uh, Vietnam and the United States. And the courageous efforts 
by many on both sides. And you think about individuals like John McCain, John Kerry, Patrick Leahy, uh, members of our Senate who, um, who without whose, whose efforts uh, we wouldn't be here today. Um, and, but these efforts continue in terms of dealing with these more legacy issues. And um, you know, we really count on uh, leadership uh, in both countries and then the goodwill again of the American and Vietnamese people uh, to ensure that these efforts um, are able to continue. Well, thanks for laying that out for us. Um, finally, I, I think we should dig into the economic aspects of the relationship uh, a little bit. And, uh, you know, I think there was uh, quite a, a reaction or a level of concern in Hanoi um, when at the beginning of the Trump administration, the U.S. pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership or TPP. Um, and uh, uh, there had been a lot of negotiations uh, that went into that uh, from both the U.S. and Vietnamese sides and, and all the other countries involved. Um, but now we have what is called IPEF, or the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity, and I understand Vietnam has joined. Um, I'm wondering if you could touch on IPEF and what it means for Vietnam and, and whether it's going to be some, you know, catalytic or important to the economic relationship. Yes, and so um, IPEF, um, as you said, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, uh, which was launched last May uh, by the United States and um, 13 other countries, including Vietnam. And really, it's, 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 it's a signal and a strong reflection of the Biden administration's commitment to economic engagement in the region. Um, but, it's, it's, it, but it's meant to be more than uh, just a trade agreement, because it takes on issues that traditional trade agreements just uh, have just not touched, um, whether it's things like the digital economy and, you know, how do we use the digital economy to promote prosperity um, in all of our countries. Um, this, this, the framework addresses issues like sustainable um, infrastructure. You know, how do we ensure that as we grow our economies and build infrastructure, particularly um, energy-related infrastructure, how do, we, how do we make sure that, um, that we're doing it in a way that is uh, green and clean and sustainable and not reliant on, on fossil fuels like coal. Um, this, this the framework is meant to address issues related to, of course, climate change, um, but also labor issues. Of course, a very strong tenet of the Biden administration is ensuring that our foreign policy works for the middle class and that our foreign policy and economic policy, trade policy, um, support our you know our labor in the United States. And so this is another area of, of discussion with with um, all the members of, of IPEF. And so we're, um, we've had a, a couple of minister level meetings. Uh, we continue to have sort of senior official level meetings as we hammer out the different aspects of this, of this IPEF, of this framework. Um, but we're very glad that, that um, you know, Vietnam joined us back in, back in May as one of the charting, charter uh, members of this gathering and um, continue to talk with them bilaterally and uh, multilaterally. This is one of the things that when we had our U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai here a uh, number of days ago. She um, discussed with you know very senior members of Vietnam's government. And so, you know, at the end of the day, though, this is really meant, I think, to to reflect the fact that the United States is an Indo-Pacific power. The United States is committed to this region. Uh, the United States is is committed uh, to this region's uh, economic success and and prosperity for the, the, all the peoples here. And so. Um, you know, I think you'll see that going forward, uh, we'll hear more and more about it um, as, our, as our colleagues at the U.S. Trade Representative's Office, Department of Commerce, continue to work on this with their colleagues around the region. Um, of course, what makes this year 2023 also significant is it's uh, the year the United States is uh, once again hosting APEC. Um, and so our sort of APEC efforts will dovetail really well with our IPEF efforts. Sorry, folks out there, it's a lot of acronyms. Um, but really, this is the year. Uh, for the United States to showcase the reality that we are uh, fully committed economically to this region because you know we are an independent power. We recognize that our prosperity and security are derived from close, closely knit and, and integrated economic trade investment relations with, uh, with all the countries here. Also, I, I wanted to just ask a little bit about, you, you've mentioned sustainable infrastructure or transparent infrastructure a couple times. 
Um, we've also talked about the, the Just Energy Transition Partnership uh, initiative that was recently announced. Another thing in that G7 orbit is a, a new 600 billion global uh, infrastructure initiative uh, among the group of seven uh, in the world. Um, and uh, I think about this in the Vietnamese and Mekong context a little. There's a saying I hear sometimes in the region when I, I travel to Southeast Asia where people say we focus so much on the sea, we forgot about the land. And it's with regard to concerns about growing Chinese uh, political influence in the sense that uh, obviously the Southeast Asia, uh, excuse me, the South China Sea issue is critical. Um, but perhaps uh, China is achieving some of its uh, strategic goals and objectives in the region through economic statecraft. Uh, and, uh, and so I'm wondering, um, what are the chances we're going to see um, perhaps uh, increased infrastructure cooperation among G7 partners like the U.S. and, and uh, Japan and Australia, for instance, perhaps in Vietnam, but in the, the Mekong uh, region generally? Well, we, um, I think you know, we've got some, some, some great tools at our disposal as we look at um, promoting infrastructure development, sustainable infrastructure development in a way that, that doesn't overburden countries here with, with uh, onerous uh, you know, debt responsibilities and, and other sort of uh, strings that might be attached to, to assistance they re receive from, from other countries. Um, you know, one, of, one of our goals is to try and unlock uh, the private capital that's, that's out there. I mean, the United States, um, we, you know, U.S. Uh, corporations, funds um, invest more in Southeast Asia and in the region uh, than every other country combined. Um, we have, you know, over a trillion dollars in, in investment stock throughout the region. Uh, we know what the, the, the ability of our private sector is to, to promote development, to promote infrastructure growth. And so um, some of the new tools we have are not so new anymore, I guess, but the Development Finance Corporation um, trade Development Agency, Exim Bank. And these are all really powerful tools that we have in our toolbox to work with our private sector, to work with host governments here, um, to ensure that they're able to meet their development needs and their infrastructure needs, but in a way that's that's on their terms and in a way that's free of coercion, that's free again of, of attached strings that they may end up regretting down the line. So um, I very much you know see the United States is in the mix here as we talk and we talk all the time. Uh, with our partners in Australia and Japan and South Korea um, about how, you know, again, we want to avoid duplicative efforts. We want to avoid redundancy. Um, we want to ensure that we're all uh, working with the same goal. And hopefully our efforts will complement each other. And uh, we do this through different uh, fora. The Japan, U.S. Mekong Power Partnership, of course, is one. Quad is another. Um, U.S. and Japan uh, Strategic Energy Partnership. I mean, there's many, many different ways that we are coordinating with our friends, allies, and partners in the region. And certainly, uh, we see Vietnam as, as a country in which we want to ensure that we're working very closely with, with our friends and allies. Um, but in a way, of course, that, that you know, um, that we want to make sure that it's, it's right for, for, for Vietnam and it's right for their own development and infrastructure goals. Thanks. Uh, before we wrap up here, uh, let me take a, a question from, from the audience. Um, this question is from Mai John of Radio Free Asia, uh, a journalist, uh, who asks, um, Ambassador Knapper uh, spoke about the good relationship between Vietnam and the U.S. in many areas, but what are the issues that may prevent the two countries from making their relationship stronger? What could undermine the relationship? Is the human rights issue in Vietnam, a problem undermining the two countries' relations. Well, um, thanks for that, by John. And I think, I mean, getting back to um, what I what I said earlier, and, and you know, sort of quoting even farther back, my my Senate testimony uh, is always being confirmed. Um, and naturally, we're going to have differences in, in areas of human rights, and um, but I think it's how we address those differences that's really important, and. I think that as long as we remain respectful of each other, as long as we ensure that we're speaking clearly and, and ensuring that we, um, we are true to our values um, in the United States, uh, that we'll continue to push, uh, to push these areas with our Vietnamese counterparts, just as they're going to continue uh, to push things with us. And so, um, 
but I, I, I you know, want to make sure that we, we, you know, we're always doing it in a way that it's respectful, that it's frank, that's, that's, that's also, um, you know, again, as I said, we're remaining, you know, we're adhering closely to the values that are very important to us as a nation. Finally, uh, just any uh, unexplored areas of the relationship or new innovative things going on that people aren't talking about, but from your, your seat as ambassador of the United States in Hanoi, uh, maybe you know something about that's not necessarily in the news, but, but you think is important. I just, um, I've just always, um, uh, it fascinates me just to see the growth of, of Vietnam's role both as a power, but as a, as a global one, increasingly. Um, you know, we've got Vietnamese peacekeepers now in, in South Sudan and Central Africa. Like, um, Vietnam sent um, scores of, of uh, not just of soldiers, but, but police, police, officer, police officers to Turkey to assist with the, um, uh, to, um, the disaster relief there. Um, I think one area I would also mention that we haven't really talked about is, is education. Um, and this is something that is so foundational as well to our two countries' relationship. Um, you know, uh, the Fulbright program predates our, our normalization, dates back to 1993, and uh, it really was, was um, elemental in, in bringing Vietnamese to the United States uh, to learn about our system, to learn about our politics and our, you know, economics and and uh, many of these folks have you know emerged as leaders in their own right here in Vietnam. Um, Vietnam is now the fifth largest uh, sender of, of students in the United States after um, India, China, South Korea and, and one other but but to be fifth um, is is really amazing and I think it's a testament to um, a couple of things. One I think it's the great um, uh, sort of commitment that that uh, Vietnamese have to education, uh, recognition the importance of of uh, you know sort of learning about the outside world, learning English, um, but it's also a reflection I think of the great the, in the deep um, well of, of goodwill here towards the United States, and um, you know the fact that folks, so many folks think highly of the U.S. I mean, polling here shows 96 percent of the Vietnamese people are favorably inclined to the U.S which is a remarkable figure. Um, and uh, we just, I think it's this education that's going to be the foundation of, continue to be the foundation upon which our two countries are, uh, are tied together. We have a university, Fulbright University of Vietnam, um, which is sort of morphed from the Fulbright program into this kind of American style institution, four year college down in Ho Chi Minh City that's educating young Vietnamese and others. Um, so you've got an American university sort of plopped down in, in, in Vietnam. And so it's pretty amazing. And again, it's a testament, I think, to the vision and the commitment of many, many people in both countries to growing our two, our two uh, uh, the relationship between us and recognizing that everything we do and everything we're going to do going forward stands on the shoulders of the kind of bridges and people to people ties that education and other exchanges are building every day, big ways and small. And so I, the reason I'm so bullish and optimistic about this relationship is that um, there is a lot of goodwill there. I mean, there are challenges, of course, but we address them in a way, again, that's, that's respectful and fair. Um, but at the end of the day, this is a relationship that's going places. It's on an upward trajectory, and it's one that's really exciting to be a part of and um, honored to, to serve here as ambassador. Well, on that upbeat note, I think we, we should wrap up. Uh, it's uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, here in the morning and uh, in the evening for you. Uh, thanks for uh, staying up and helping us navigate and better understand uh, both developments within Vietnam and the region, uh, but you know how that comes to bear on the relationship uh, between the United States and, and Vietnam uh, going forward. So uh, thanks, Ambassador Knapper, for joining us, and uh, we look forward to doing this again sometime. Yeah, absolutely. I'm. Uh... I'm, I'm always happy to, to do these events. I'm always happy to tout the U.S.-Vietnam relationship, and uh, really, I'm just, uh, super proud of all the work uh, folks here in our embassy and our consul general do every day, um, both Americans and Vietnamese. You know, a lot of people here are working real hard on behalf of this relationship, and so I'm I'm really proud to be part of the the same team as they. Great. Well, well, thanks again, and uh, we'll be in touch. All right. Thanks, John. Thanks, everybody.